Look, I'm a little wound up this morning, all right? I want to take a moment to acknowledge that we are meeting this week on, tra on a traditional unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. Mi'kmaq history is rooted in community, in trade, and in the spirit of cooperation. But as we know, it's a history tainted by racism and injustice. The Mi'kmaq people remind us of our country's dark colonial past, and it's our responsibility as trade unionists to help shine a light. I think it's fitting that this week our union made good on a promise to host a national roundtable to discuss issues related to racism and Islamophobia in Canada. And we held that round table right here in Halifax, a city that is coming to terms with its own difficult history. Earlier this year, City Council decided to physically remove the statue of Edward Cordwanos from Halifax Park, a man implicated in many of the injustices faced by Mi'kmaq people. It was a small, but it was a symbolic step towards truth and reconciliation. And similar actions are happening in other communities right now, including most recently in Victoria, BC. Halifax Council's decision sent a signal that the history of First Nations people must be confronted no longer ignored. It reminds us that resistance, struggle, truth, and perseverance are virtues worth celebrating this day and every day. And it's these virtues that will guide us towards a more progressive, inclusive, and just society. It is truly an honor to be here. You know, I'll tell you, there may not be a more peaceful place to spend a summer's evening in all of Canada than on the Halifax waterfront. Whether you're on the boardwalk or looking down from Citadel Hill, there's a sense of peace and real calm to this city. And I hope each of you get to take a moment in between our work to enjoy some quiet time. Because believe me, <laughs> look, folks like us, we wouldn't know peace and calm if it kicked us straight in the face. We're running full tilt all the time. Our responsibilities to our members, to our communities, to our families, they're endless. And why do we do it? Why do we put ourselves through the pain and the stress and the sleepless nights? It's because we want to build a better world. We want to make a positive difference. We see challenges around us every day and we want to take them on. It's in our DNA, it's who we are. It's the people that can't take no for an answer. We're the people who aren't afraid to let our opinions known. We're the people who find ourselves in the middle of the toughest debates. Now I know what you're thinking. That means we're also the people that don't get invited to many dinner parties. <laughs> but you know what? That's okay, who needs them anyway? This weekend, we're here together. Unifor leadership. Unifor family. Sisters and brothers. And believe me, there's no place where I'd rather be. The Canadian Council, in part, a celebration. Unifor is five years old. We're five years. Can you believe it? What an achievement. Just step back for one minute and think of where we started. We were a vision, right? We were a vision, a vision of two influential Canadian unions coming together to chart a new course, a vision of bold, brave, inclusive new union that was big enough, smart enough, and determined enough to change the politics of this country. And we did it. I know it doesn't always feel like it, but we did. Think about this. Not only did we defeat the cynical, stale politics of the Stephen Harpers in the country, we laid the groundwork for a progressive resurgence not seen in generations. We were a reminder to everyone in Canada that the labor movement and working class people still had muscle and we were ready to flex it. And that's why we were born sisters and brothers. Today, we have an NDP government in British Columbia. First time in over 15 years. 
a government that might actually, for the first time, get, out of, get rid of our ridiculous, and I mean ridiculous, first past the post voting system and institute a model that's fair and balanced for workers. It was our doing, sisters and brothers. Today we have an NDP government in Alberta. Who would have believed that in 2013? And an NDP government in Alberta that was the first to set its sights on a $15 an hour minimum wage. An NDP government that has been a punch in the gut to Conservatives all across Canada. And it made the country stand up and take notice. Our activists played a critical role in all of this. In Saskatchewan, we have a Conservative government that was so threatened by our union and others that they backtracked on plans to sell off Crown corporations. In Ontario, we elected a Liberal government that took its cues from progressive voices. A government that helped force changes to public pensions the first in decades. Free post-secondary education for those who could least afford it. A major overhaul on the province's labour laws. Unfortunately, we've seen the political headwinds change in Ontario, and frankly, not for the better by any stretch of the imagination. And believe me, I got a lot to say about Doug Ford, but I'll come back to him in a little while. In Quebec, through our activism, we've managed to keep dangerous far-right far right political voices at bay, even when it seemed a major electoral swing was imminent. In New Brunswick, we've opened new dialogues with the Gallant government, advancing the interests of workers. In fact, New Brunswick has become the latest province to introduce paid domestic violence leave for women escaping abuse at home. And that's because of us, folks, because of the work of our union. Federally, we are working with a government that actively seeks uniforms, views and ideas. Whether that's on NAFTA strategy, a just transition policy, pharmacare, public pensions. Look, even when we don't always agree, if I look at the political landscape of our country today, I see a far different place, a much better place than I did in 2013. A place where social programs are valued, not vilified where workers' voices are more respected and not ridiculed, where the rights of equity seating groups are openly discussed, not dismissed, and our union is right in the middle of it all. We're making a difference. Have we achieved everything we need? Not even close. Have we made a difference in the lives of millions of working people in this country? You're damn right we have. And that's because of the hard work each and one, every one of you do every day and for the last five years to make this union strong. So on this fifth anniversary, we should all be damn proud of what we've accomplished together. In the five years, we've seen our union embrace political activism as a critical part of the work we do. Because political action is a key part of achieving our vision of becoming a union for everyone, a union for all working class people. But I also see a union that has lost, hasn't lost sight in our collective bargaining priorities either. In fact, I see a union that has seized the opportunity that a new union presented to transform its bargaining strategies. I see a union that is ambitious and that has set very high expectations for itself. And those expectations, the belief that anything is possible, have lit a fire in our members to demand more from their employers and frankly more from their union. And why shouldn't they? Our members aren't naive. They read about Canada's strong economy, about interest rate hikes, low unemployment, record profits. They read about the richest 87 families in Canada owning as much wealth as the 1.4 million Canadians living in New Brunswick, Newfoundland and Prince Edward Island. That is absolutely 
outrageous. But despite what they read, they don't feel like boom times for workers. What they experience is far different. Threats of outsourcing, threats of job loss, industry disruption, precarious work, retirement insecurity. When I read the recent CCPA study charting out the 87 Canadian wealthiest families, two things struck me. One, boy, we talk a good game on inequality in Canada. But it just goes to show we aren't doing enough to fix the problem. And that includes tax reform, which as we saw last year, just remember last year, when Finance Minister Bill Morneau got blowback on proposed changes. This is still difficult political terrain to navigate. And two, we can never lose sight of the critical roles unions play through collective bargaining to help rebalance these income scales. We can never lose sight of how critical a tool collective bargaining is for workers to take back our share of the wealth that we help create every single day. And we are certainly using our collective bargaining to shake things up. In BC, I think of our members at the Park Casino, Local 3000. Members not only struggling with low wages, but with the outsourcing of their work and our union mobilized. We consider this round of bargaining to be a strategic priority. We engage in our hospitality and gaming council. We leverage the fact that this casino was undergoing a massive expansion. We laid it right out for the employer. Outsourcing, job insecurity, low wages, we're over and done with all of those arguments. And where did we land? Year one, get this. Wage increases averaging 27.5%. And 2% wage increases after that. They're the highest wages in the BC casino sector. Congratulations to all involved. Sick days for workers, first time ever. All outsourced food and beverage work was bought back in the house with full bargaining rights. What an incredible achievement. What a victory for our union. But it's also a testament of the power of our collective bargaining. I think of Bombardier facilities in Toronto, Local 112, 673. We all know this is my home plant. Listen, I always say I'm clock number 28091, and I'm damn proud of it. A factory that, quite frankly, is one of the crown jewels of Canada's manufacturing sector. We entered bargaining with major question marks surrounding the future of the Q400 program. Major question marks on whether the Downsview facility itself would be sold and relocated. In recent years, non-core work, and I hate it when they call it that, but call it non-core work. It's our work, it's damn well core. But we watched as that work was being siphoned off to low-wage plants in Mexico. What a surprise. We're getting it from all sides. So we threw down the gauntlet with the employer. This work is ours, it's staying with us, and if they didn't like it, we told them you better buckle up for one hell of a fight. And they understood that we don't make empty threats. And we were successful, sisters and brothers, at the end of the day. Not only did we secure decent wages and pension improvements, we secured the work commitments and protected our jobs of all of our members. And if and when Bombardier moves that production to a new facilities, guess what? It's all uniform work that belongs to our members. And what a heck of a victory for all of our members. With so much uncertainty, there's no light at the end of the tunnel, and I couldn't be prouder. I look around the country, and I see our union making inroads at other bargaining tables as well. Frankly, and even in some of the most challenging circumstances. In Eastern Canada, we're making steady progress in the pulp and paper sector laying out a great pattern deal that will affect over 12,000 members. This is at a time when the forest industry is under siege. Unfair US-led trade attacks on softwood and groundwood paper have gripped our workplaces, but we're making progress. 
I could walk right through it. We're advancing the goals of our collective bargaining program at some of the biggest workplaces. I think of New Flyer Bus in Winnipeg. Across the entire Bell Canada chain, Bell Craft, Bell Clerical, BTS, in our hospital units throughout Ontario, in hospitals right here in Nova Scotia. We signed a first agreement finally after a major, major multi-year battle with the McNeil government. I don't have a lot of time for Stevie McNeil. We don't like each other very much at all. He really hates it when I call him Stevie because his name is Stephen. Anyway, let's not go there, I'm digressing. At Casino Windsor, in, at Casino. Caesar's Casino in Windsor. After an incredibly difficult two-month strike, I think about Jasper Lodge, Jasper Park Lodge, the hotel in Alberta. I think right here in Halifax at the Irving Shipyard. That was one difficult round of bargaining, frankly more difficult than I think anybody expected. The employer, if you can imagine, the employer came in hand, made major concessions, extraordinary concessions. Our members weren't going to take it and they were ready to fight. And at the end of the day, our committee fought off the concessions and ended up with a fair deal that makes improvements to wages, pensions, subcontracting, and so many other areas that I can't even begin to list it. But it was also a deal that affects hundreds and hundreds of new members. And for many, it was their first kick at the can. It was their first direct experience with a union. So I firmly believe that it's our collective bargaining that builds the union. It's a moment when members are the most engaged. It's an opportunity to communicate. It's a platform for our mobilization. But what we've also seen is our collective bargaining can grow the union. In recent rounds, we've managed to expand our scope clauses to secure new work, which brings new members into the fold. That is exactly what we committed to do with our all-in organizing campaign, leveraging our bargaining power to grow our union. Just last month, just last month in Ontario, we ratified new agreements at the five great casino and hotel properties. These deals not only made major improvements to work standards, wages, pensions, but they also expanded the scope clause of our bargain unit. So over the next 18 months, our membership base in these casinos will double by another 2,000 members. And that's what we can do in collective bargaining. <laughs> Think of what it'll do. It'll give us a louder, loudy, a louder voice for casino workers in Canada, giving us greater leverage to bargain future deals. This is an incredible achievement that's worth celebrating. And this is exactly the work that Unifor was built to do. But when I share the success stories, I couldn't be prouder of the work our local leadership and our bargaining committees, our workplace reps, do each and every day. But bargaining wins don't come easy. They never have. Our success at the bargaining table is measured so much by the outcome as it is by the struggle. And we've had some nasty tussles this past year, let me tell you. But struggle is how workers make lasting and historic gains. It's how we build solidarity amongst our members and in our communities. Just ask our sisters and brothers in General Motors and Ingersoll or North Star Aerospace workers in Milton. But too often these fights aren't fair. Let me give you an example. The Elastic Aerospace in Quebec. This past March, our members ratified a new collective agreement putting to an end to what was Unifor's longest ever strike. 1,073 days. Think about that. It's nearly three years of our members walking the picket line. How does this happen? One of the reasons that the employer was able to use scabs to do our work, scabs crossing the line, undermining our bargaining, 
undermining our fundamental rights, keeping our members out on the street, refusing to get back to the bargaining table. And then we went to Goderich, Ontario. <laughs> this summer, nearly 400 of our members at Compass Minerals were forced to take strike action. It's the biggest salt mine in the world. It's right off the shores of Lake Huron. Our members weren't striking for higher wages or benefits. They were, reduced, they were striking to reduce work hours. They were striking to manage their overtime. These are workers who are exhausted, working around the clock in some of the toughest and most dangerous conditions manageable. Workers who want to spend time at home with their families, giving their bodies a rest. Then they hit the picket line. And what does the employer do? They bring in scabs. They bring in scabs all the way from New Brunswick. Workers on strike, yet the mine keeps running. Employers got no incentive to bargain a deal. So enough is enough. We hosted a major rally. And I was so proud as I looked at the rally and I saw our retirees filling the park. And I saw our locals from across the province. And I saw our members from across the country who were taking programs in Port Elgin that came down on bus. And we took all the strikers and we had them come up on the stage. And in that community event, we pledged to them that we were going to bring this to an end. And we were going to do what we had to do to get the stabs out of the mine. And we committed to them. And let me tell you, sisters and brothers, when we make a commitment, we bloody well keep our word. And we went to the mine and we put up a complete blockade and we brought hundreds of our members and I'll tell you it simplifies it when there's one road in and it's the same road out but you see when we put up those hundreds of pallets it was not only to keep the scabs out but if you wanted to come all the way from New Brunswick to, stay our, to do our jobs, well then you might as well stay in the mine for 10 hours, 12 hours, 15 hours, 20 hours, 30 hours. Let me tell you, after 36 hours they wanted out, they were so desperate to get out of the mine, one of the scabs jumped into the lake with his knapsack and started swimming and was picked up by a sea doo for crying out loud. And then we had the scabs that were in a bus that were lined up for hours that wanted to get in. And that was the bus there lined up for hours that was waiting to take them out. But let me tell you, after hours and hours and hours, the police knew nobody was going anywhere. And the more we told them the, no buses were cross our picket line, the more they understood no buses were crossing the picket line. And you see that bus that was full of scabs turned around. And that was the last time that bus ever came back to the picket line. And you see it left the bus, the empty bus. That was to take out the scabs. And the police said to us, okay, you gotta let them out. And we said, nah, we don't think so. <laughs> they said, but you gotta let them out. And we said, if they wanna spend so much time in there, they can stay for another 36 hours. And they said, okay, what's the deal? Because they were adamant that they were gonna take the bus in so that the scabs could get on the bus and drive through our picket line. We said to them, what part do you not understand that not one more bus will ever cross our picket line? And we came to an agreement. 
that we were going to walk the scabs out. And they were going to walk through our gauntlet. And they were going to look at the striking members whose jobs they took. And they were going to look in the faces of the kids that were on the picket line. And we forced them to do the walk of shame. And I'll tell you, I've never been so proud when Lana Payne, Terry Farrell, Scott Doherty, Gary Lynch and myself, we walked those scabs out of the building. And once they left, they never came back. And let me tell you, it took 12 days. It took 12 days, but we settled the dispute. You know, the company had proposals. They wanted us to work 60 to 72 hour weeks. And you know what they got? They got nothing. They wanted us to weak our pension plan. You know what they got? They got nothing. We wanted wage increases. You know what we got? We got a lot of them. But you know what? We wanted respect, and let me tell you something. Our union got respect in droves. And not only respect by them, but every damn employer from coast to coast to coast. And I'll tell you, you see the community? You know how we always talk about being a union that's based in our communities? But let me tell you, the community support was nothing like you've ever seen, let me tell you. So when the courts told us we had to remove the wooden pallets and remove the cars, we said, okay. And we complied, so we moved the pallets and we moved the cars and then we bought in 15 of the biggest damn tractors ever made by a human. <laughs> and we blockaded the road. I didn't know what to do. The police are looking at us, and then we started organizing tractor races. And then we spoke to the mayor, and we said, listen, out of respect and love for the community, we want to host a week of community events. And so we asked to shut down the road so that we could hold events for the community, and the mayor obliged. So as the police sat there and they watched, we had an incredible concert where we invited the entire community. If you can imagine, we brought in a Ferris wheel. We brought in bouncy castles. We even brought in a damn swimming pool because it was so hot out. And the kids had a time of their life. And when the police called the mayor to say, do they have a permit? He says, oh, of course we gave them permits. And that's what happens when you build a relationship with the communities. You know, during that time period, I was making a pitch. Because I was making a pitch because I personally wanted to set up a petting zoo for the kids. So we got the llamas and we had the horses, but the kids were tough bargainers. They were demanding elephants. And we couldn't get the damn permits for the elephants. <laughs> uh, it was an interesting picket line. Let me tell you, sisters and brothers, in all seriousness. Listen, oh, I want to thank all of our rank and file members, our leadership. I want to thank so many hundreds of you that are in the room today for what you did. I want to thank our staff. I want to thank our leadership team. I want to personally recognize my assistant, Scott Doherty, staff rep, Glenn Saunier, Terry Farrell, but most importantly, I want to thank the leadership of Local 16 O. They deserve so much credible credit. What an incredible group of trade unionists. Gary Lynch, Stefan Lynch, Larry Gaynor, Lance Greer. They put it all on the line for us, sisters and brothers. So please, will the leadership team stand and be recognized? Thank you so much for your incredible work. So, 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 solidarity. So, 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 solidarity. So, 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 solidarity. So, 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 solidarity.
Let me tell you something. It's damn well time for our governments to legislate strong and enforceable anti-scab laws in every jurisdiction in this country. End of story! And I know exactly where we can start. We're going to start in Gander, Newfoundland, right at DJ Composites. A dispute. It's closing in on two years. An employer that's not only locked out our members, but then has the nerve to put job postings in the local papers. Hiring scabs. Today, I'm putting DJ Composite on notice. Because we're bringing the full force of Newfoundland straight to Gander, just like we did in Goderich. being shipped from across North America. And the province is doing absolutely nothing. Says its hands are tied. Listen, give me a break. Wake up, step in, legislate arbitration, kick the scabs out, or we're damn well going to do it ourselves. We're going to get our members back to work because enough is enough. I do want to say, despite the hardship, you know, it's fascinating how you can find a silver lining in all of this mess. When our members of DJ Composites were locked out, they applied but were denied their EI benefits. Existing rules don't qualify you for EI during a strike or a lockout. It turns out the company had never intended to reach a deal with our members because they treated it like a mass termination. So we pushed hard to win this back pay. We pushed all the way to the Social Security Tribunal. And just weeks ago, guess what? We won. Some of our members will now be eligible for EI payments all the way back to the start of the lockout. If you can believe it, thousands and thousands of dollars in back pay that's desperately needed. This sets a new precedent for all workers in the future. What an achievement. Congratulations to Local 597. Keep up the fight, sisters and brothers. Please stand. I know you're here in the room. And Dean Lindsay, please stand as well for your incredible work you did at the EI Tribunal. Where are you? Stand and be recognized. There you are. We're coming to see you soon. We've got one other active dispute happening in our union, and that's at Old Castle Building Services in Quebec. And we're going to be acknowledging you, obviously, during this council as well. But look, let me take you to Thunder Bay for a moment. Since we're talking about scabs, I tend to get a little wound up when we talk about scabs. I want to talk about the Port Arthur Health Centre. An incredible unit, a small unit of 65 members, all women. Most earning minimum wage or close to it. Up until three nights ago, these sisters were locked into a four-month strike with their employer. Look, this is a classic story of a needy versus the greedy. Doctors, the employers, making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, trying to push around minimum wage workers. 
Here's how bad it is. Doctors' kids, spoiled, privileged. They're on the other side of the picket line. They're showing our members the fingers, shouting obscenities, being completely disrespectful. You know, frankly, I'm not really surprised because the apple doesn't far, fall far from the tree. See, I grew up with Guyanese parents, so they say to me, like, goats don't make sheep. Guyanese have a different lingo, you gotta know. <laughs> but seriously, let me tell you the type of disrespect that symbolized this whole dispute. It came from one of these arrogant doctors. Do you know what he said? He said to one of our striking sisters, any monkey that can peel a banana can be trained to do your work. So is that what you really think, doctor? Let me tell you what I think. All I can say to the doctor that said that to our sister, you can fuck right off. Sorry if I offended anyone, but I was deeply and am still deeply offended. What a joke. This is a story of precarious work that's playing out right across our country. And I'll tell you, it's shameful. But you see, but Port Arthur quickly became an important struggle for our union. Because through this struggle, our sisters have found their voice. Then they found it through their union. Let me tell you. Our sisters have far more respect for those patients than those damn doctors ever did. And this decision to go on strike, to blockade the clinic was incredibly difficult. Think about the optics of all this and think about the challenge, the challenges that our sisters went through. Patients, patients that they've known for so long waited months for medical appointments, some of them. The problem is, is that the employer had no intention to bargain. We had to take an action. So of course we wanted to give the patients all kinds of notice. We took out full page ads in the newspapers saying to the community, we're closing the clinic. We gave patients a week notice. And then closer to the end, we gave them four more full page ads in the newspaper saying, okay, this is final notice. We did everything we could to get the company's attention. Then I called the company lawyer on the Saturday of the long weekend. I left him a message. He called me back on Sunday. And he said, listen, out of respect for your union, I'm calling you. And so I said, you better get back to the bargaining table. Have you read the notices? He says, yes, we've read the notices. I said, by chance, have you been following what's been going on in Godrich? He says, yes, I think everybody across the country has been noticed what is going on in Godrich. I said, okay, you're next. I said, so let me give you a little advice. He says, what do you want me to tell my clients? I said, listen, you better tell your clients that when they get back to work on Tuesday after the long weekend, they better call all their patients and cancel the appointments. So you know, I texted him on Monday and said, any update? I texted him on Tuesday, said, have you spoken to your charming clients? You know, I never got a, a response. That's because they never had any intention to settle. Then when I showed up to Thunder Bay on Wednesday, I couldn't believe my eyes. Somehow a massive fence was erected around the perimeter of the clinic. And I'm wondering to myself, how in the world did it get there? <laughs> and then when I was talking to the police, because they were astonished, I said to them, I said, you know what? I bet that fence was erected by the police at the Fort William Health Clinic across town trying to steal away the clients. <laughs> <laughs> nah. 
<laughs> they didn't buy my story, but it was the best I could do with no notice. <laughs> Look, I tried. <laughs> but you know, once the clinic was shut down, the community didn't turn their backs on us. They kept showing their support. So did other unions. But it was after that demonstration that the police understood. The doctors understood that we were serious. The demonstration of solidarity is what forced the doctors back to the table. Because sisters and brothers, when hundreds of us show up on a picket line, the police are powerless to do anything about it. So I am so proud to know that clinic was down Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And let me tell you something. As of three nights ago, our incredible sisters at the Port Arthur Health Clinic ratified their new agreement and they'll be going back to work next week. And what an incredible new deal it is. Wage increases of 21% for those at the low end of the pay scale. A member once making $14.71 an hour is now making $16.29 an hour. These women want increases to their benefits. New weekend and shift premiums for the first time ever. What an accomplishment for our members of Local 229. I want to thank the incredible work of my assistant, Katha Forche, Health Care Director Andy Savella, Local President Carrie Jefford, but most importantly, our bargaining committee, Laura Salmi, Maria Mantilla, Megan Zepchinski, Janice Sutton. Please stand up, sisters, and be recognized by the Council for your incredible work. These women walked the picket line, not just for themselves, but for the millions of precarious workers in Canada. They fought not just for better working conditions, but to build a union that's rooted in its community. At this council, I'm recommending that we think about ways to follow their example, to ensure Unifor is doing just that in all of our cities and towns building a community presence, engaging with our allies, moving to the next step of our successful local union task force project. But most importantly, these sisters in Port Arthur stood up for millions of women in Canada, women whose skills have been chronically undervalued and whose labor has been historically exploited. This is more than just one small fight at a health clinic. This was the latest battleground in our fight for equality and ending the gender wage gap. This fight was about economic justice for all women. This was a fight that our union was born to take on 315,000 members strong. And these sisters made our union so proud. Look, I want to take you. I want to switch, I want to switch continents. I want to tell you of a quick story of an experience I had this year in Ireland. Some of you may have followed the recent Irish referendum on abortion. It's funny, I always had this naive impression that Europe was so much more socially connected than we are. So earlier this year, the Irish voted overwhelmingly to strike down abortion laws that were quite frankly written Many Irish women for years were forced, if you can imagine, to travel out of the country to find health care services denied them at home. So I was in Ireland. My daughter was getting married. And I'm walking around, and we're all walking around. And there was a group of men 
there was about 70, 75 people in, in, in like a community gathering area. And one of the men was up on a, on a small platform with a megaphone. And he was urging everyone to vote no. And when I took a look, there was probably about 75 people, about, of which 70 were men, and so many of them were nodding. And I thought to myself, who in the hell do they think they are to make these types of decisions for women? I just couldn't get my head around it. But you know, sometimes I look at these examples, and I think of all the conservative, backward thinking, Women are making so much progress, and society, candidly, is making progress. It's little by little. It's inch by inch. But then, you know, every once in a while, then you stumble, and then I take a look south of the border, and I take a look at Donald Trump. I know, sorry to break the mood. <laughs> and believe me, he's driving me crazy. A president who ch chose to defund Planned Parenthood clinics. Think about it. Denying access to birth control and private insurance coverage for reproductive health services. A president who reinstated a global gag rule, preventing recipients of U.S. foreign aid from offering any information or advocacy about abortion care. A president who is now ready to install Brett Kavanaugh, look, an ultra-conservative to the bench of the Supreme Court. And you know what? The looming threat is that this new court bench will overturn a historic 1973 ruling that provided a legal foundation for abortion in the United States. You know, sometimes it's like for every two steps forward, women are forced to take another step back. But let's not pretend for a second that Trump isn't playing to his political base. Millions of Americans support this move. There's a deep systemic sexism in our community. I'm all wound up again. <laughs> there is. And it manifests in our public policy and in our workplaces. Remember the long gun registry? This was the firearm registry designed to help police monitor gun ownership in Canada. It was established not after the horrific Montreal school massacre that left 14 women dead. This was the same registry that Stephen Harper's government couldn't wait to throw in the trash. And he did, even as women groups protested. It bothers me how, look, cavalier some could be about gun ownership in this country. I think of the two beautiful young women shot and killed in Toronto this past month. I think of Fredericton, New Brunswick, and the four individuals that lost their lives just last week. Did you know that handgun registrations in Canada increased by 38% since 2012, that in 2016, there were almost 200,000 more handgun owners in Canada than there were in 2012. In that same period, firearm-related crime has risen by 33%. Here's what we know. Women are five times more likely to die as a result of domestic violence if their partner has a gun. Here's what we also know. Women that are financially independent, women who have access to strong social supports and personal support networks, these are women better equipped to leave a violent relationship. It's true. So that's why I get so infuriated when I hear that Canadian women still today earn an annual income that on average 26% less than men. When I hear that women are overrepresented in part-time precarious work. Gun laws, reproductive rights, income equality, these are all connected. If Unifor was built 
to fight for a stronger economy and a safer society then the fight for women's equality is all our fight. As men, let me tell you, we owe it to our sisters, our mothers, our daughters, to be active in this struggle. Later this year, the federal government is set to introduce new federal pay equity legislation, something our union has fought so very hard to win. But you know the success of this new law will depend on how deeply we are committed to make it work. Unifor is the largest union in the federally, federally regulated industries. We need to ensure our staff and bargaining committees fully understand the new law and put it into practice. And I'm recommending that we approach this new legislation with a full court press, all hands on deck, all of Unifor's federal workplaces, I'm telling you, will be involved. And we're going to make this a Unifor priority over the next 12 months. You need to know that Unifor's commitment to equity is unwavering. I think back, I think back over the last five years, and I think about the tough conversations we've had, including right here on this council floor. I think about the lessons we've learned about creating accessible spaces. How inclusivity is more than just about good intentions, but it's about a commitment to real action. And I think about our campaigns and how we are finding ways to do the important work that always needs to be done. This weekend, we're unveiling a campaign to end Canadian blood services discriminatory blood ban for men who have sex with men. This is an incredibly important campaign, and one that has been spearheaded by activists, our activists in the LGBTQ community. Because if not us, always remember this. If it's not us that's prepared to do it, then who will? I take a look at our equity audit. It was a massive multi-year undertaking. It was a project that helped us identify our strengths, but also to show us where we are failing. And as an organization, we have to be comfortable acknowledging that. I'm not going to waste my time pretending that trade unions are the perfect embodiment of diversity and equality, because we're not. We have serious challenges that must be addressed. And we're not afraid to have these conversations in uniform because we know we'll be a stronger, a more relevant organization as a result of having them. This council marks the culmination of our equity audit work. And you're going to hear more about it, the work that is taking place. And I want us to commit to seeing it through. But sisters and brothers, this is just a start. One thing I learned is that equity work is a process, but it's not an end to itself. It's about changing how we understand our organization, about how we interact with our members and each other, how we do the day-to-day -day work of our union. All that must always happen through an equity lens. Five years ago, we said we are going to be a union for everyone. And five years in, we know that being a union for everyone being, is being a union for equity. Look, our vision for a new union was about solidifying our power base in Canada. It's about using our strength to put workers' issues back at the top of the political agenda. But it was also about being a force for positive change in the labor movement itself. A movement that is so vital to our country. But candidly, it had developed into a bit of a, how do I say it? It's almost as if developed a little institutional fatigue. How's that for diplomacy? I'm getting a little better. It's taken five years, but I'm trying. Let me be clear. Unifor isn't bigger than the labor movement. The labor movement is working class people working together, organizing and advocating for progressive change. But there are situations, and let's be candid, where unions make decisions based on their own self-interests and not what's best for the movement overall. 
And this is a real challenge, especially because today private sector unionization is less than 15 percent and falling year after year. I take a look at the United States. Unionization rate is in single digits. Workers need to maintain full democratic control over who represents them, always. And that is what's at the current dispute, the heart of the current dispute with the Canadian Labour Congress and its affiliates. As a union founded on the principles of democracy, accountability and transparency, we're not going to sit on the sidelines as workers' rights get trampled on, like we saw last year with the ATU, like we saw earlier this year with the Unite Here Local 75. It's just not going to happen. Earlier this year, our National Executive Board made the very difficult decision to disaffiliate from the Canadian Labour Congress. And I've said it before, this was without a doubt the most difficult decision I've ever had uh, been a part of. Did I have my doubts? Of course I did. But could I sit back in good conscience and watch as workers, our sisters and brothers, that democratically decide to switch unions, get attacked by their union headquarters? Could I stand by as watch as workers face intimidation, face threats to their personal safety, face acts of violence? Not a chance. Not a single chance. If anyone thinks that the union we've built is going to be complicit to this sort of behavior, that we'd be okay with union goons and thugs slashing tires like they did to Bob Kinnear's daughter, stealing away workers' assets like they've done to so many of the thousands of workers in this room where our union halls were confiscated, our bank accounts were seized, the checks were sent to the United States, they put Canadian locals in trusteeship strictly to quell dissent. It's not happening. And we're not going to change unless this body tells us to, because the unions haven't really been paying attention to what it is we've been doing for the last five years. The fact is, there are rules under the CLC Constitution that simply aren't being followed. There are protocols in place to met, let members transition to the union of their choice that are simply being ignored. In some cases, workers are opting to decertify their union entirely. Can you believe it? We are literally turning workers away from unions because we either don't think they're capable of making their own decisions or we just don't like the decisions they've made. Either way, it's wrong. It's a major crack in our movement's foundation and it needs a permanent fix once and for all. Over the past months, we put ideas on the table to the Congress. Conversations are ongoing, although there's a great deal of resistance amongst the other affiliates, frankly, as was expected. We've had excellent discussions this year with our members at the regional councils, and I can tell you from the response from our locals and the support that the NEB has received, it is greatly appreciated. But under our Constitution, Council delegates must affirm the board's decision. And we're going to talk, Shane will talk about the public review board decision. Listen, we are going to make this the first order of business on our agenda today. And we're going to get straight at it. I don't think there's anyone denying that the CLC is a more relevant organization with the uniform, is it? There's no question about our role in the labor movement from coast to coast to coast. And there isn't a day that goes by where I don't think about the fallout that many of our activists and local leaders have felt. But if this disaffiliation can set things right once and for all, then sisters and brothers, we have made a lasting difference. And we'll be a stronger movement for it. Because if there's been any time in the last five years that a strong, active labor movement is needed, it's right now. Because there's storm clouds forming in many directions. 
And despite our victories over five years, we need to sit up and take notice. We've, we're just over a year out from the next federal election, and it's hard to get a clear road on the politics of the country. Polls in Alberta suggest Rachel Notley is in for the fight of her life. And as encouraging as political headwinds have been in BC, coalition governments are tenuous at best. And in Quebec, a place that's been gripped by shocking acts of racism, Islamophobia and violence in recent years, seems ready to elect a CAQ, a right-wing party that spouts ethnic division and intolerance. In New Brunswick, a potential conservative win can upset all of the meaningful progress and dialogue that workers have formed with pre rare Gallant. And in Ontario, no oh boy, the election of Doug Ford was a real body blow to the good work done by Kathleen Wynne's Liberals. In his first months, Ford's Tories, they look like the Tories of old. Go back to the Harris days pretending there's inefficiencies in government and scapegoating the poor to pay for his spending cuts. Ford plans to scrap the $15 minimum wage, which is scheduled to take effect in January. He's scrapping plans to test a guaranteed income program in cities across the province. And he's slashing planned welfare payments increases in half. To be honest, what concerns me most is how Ford, in his popular slash and burn rhetoric, appealed to so many working class and union voters, 40% in some polls. The polls also tell us there's a deep divide between conservative progressive voters in Ontario. It's as if there's a perfect fracture down the middle of the political spectrum. spectrum. Ford voters said they were concerned about too much immigration that they saw little value in the Me Too movement and how it's brought awareness to sexual assault. What most concerns me is that too many Ford voters expressed a great distrust in journalism. That sounds a bit too much like the political song being sound down south. And boy, do we need professional quality journalism in Canada today more than ever. And I think of the incredible work being done by our Uniform Media Council and through the Media Action Plan to protect and strengthen local journalism. We shouldn't read too much into these polling figures so close after an election, but we certainly can't ignore them either. All this tells me is that we need to be ready to go in this next federal election. And I'm recommending we move quickly to plan out a massive air and ground campaign and that we get down to work right away. Because this election is crucial. It'll either reaffirm our commitment towards more progressive Canada, it'll be a, or it'll be a return to the dark days of Stephen Harper. Only this time it'll be Andrew Scheer. He's kind of like a Stephen Harper with dimples, right? <laughs> I probably shouldn't say that, but anyway, I did. But I'll tell you this. We're not moving backwards. Not when pharmacare is on the line. Not when labor law reform is on the line. Not when trade reform is on the line. We just can't afford it. And here's what really scares me. The federal conservative war chest is filling up quickly. Last quarter, the Tories fundraised $6 million. That's more than double the federal Liberals and 10 times what the NDP rose. And so we are in for one hell of a fight. But let me tell you, if I'm picking sides in a fight, I'll take the side this union is on. Each one of you, any day of the week. So let's get to work and get this done. Don't worry, I'm wrapping up. <laughs> this is a big country. We've got a lot of issues. We've got a lot of struggles and a lot of fights and a lot of campaigns. That's why there's always so much to say. Look, there's going to be a lot of key issues playing out in this next election. 
issues that'll be front and center for workers. Climate change is gonna be one of them. And our union has to be in this debate. Our commitments to build a just and sustainable world will be tested against our immediate workplace needs. We have to have a vision, we have to have a strategy. Our voice is so critical. Who better than Unifor? A union that represents workers in nearly every economic sector to craft solutions, to offer direction. And I'm gonna recommend that coming out of this council, we'll work across the sectors to, you know, to develop a coherent climate and just transition program that'll guide our work in the coming years. But amongst all the potential federal election issues, I can guarantee that trade will factor in so large. In fact, trade winds are blowing these political storms right into our backyards. In forestry, there's still no clear path towards a resolution on softwood lumber. I spoke yesterday afternoon to Christia Freeland, still no movement. Our members have been propped up by surging U.S. demand. But at some point, that bubble's gonna burst, and there'll be a major questions on the long-term sustainability of the industry. In newsprint, it's a totally different story. 70% of the U.S. newspapers re re rely on imported Canadian paper. New tariffs have simply jacked up production costs, and that's only added to the pain of an already hurting industry. In steel and aluminum, Trump's national security tariffs are a complete ridiculous move that threatens to kill jobs on both sides of the border. Canada's counter tariffs on U.S. goods was drastic, dramatic, but I can't see we had any choice. It was a necessary move. But no one can ever win in a trade war, especially a war with your biggest trading partner. But Trump is launching an all-out assault on our economy. He's using these trade actions to bolster U.S. industrial stocks, make good on election promises, and gain an upper hand in the trade negotiations, including NAFTA. Look, right now he's considering slapping tariffs on Canadian cars and parts. That would, that would amount to economic suicide in this country. And what just, I can't shake my head because he's proven irrational enough to do it. Trump is the biggest threat to our economic well-being since the Great Recession of 2008. <laughs> One of the frustrating things and what's difficult is that his criticism of the global trade system, in some cases, isn't all that wrong. Take a look at Canada. Take a look at what countries dump into our market and we absolutely have no access to that, to theirs. But the facts are is we're not Trump's punching bag, and frankly, we're gonna make sure that we hit back. Yeah. And we are consulting with our members, and we're consulting with the federal government to ensure that there are meaningful supports in place to keep our facilities running and our members on the job. And we are mapping out a plan to tackle the pending auto crisis and making sure our facilities get the products that they need for the long term. These are extraordinary times, but you have to know we are using this moment to push big ideas in how to fix this broken trade system, to put workers first and communities first. Look, this is why we launched our People's Trade Campaign. And in the coming months, the federal government will be launching consultations on the progressive trade agenda. It's what actually we asked them to do. So it's our chance to finally set a new mandate for trade. It's a chance to say no to the ridiculous Trans-Pacific Partnership deal, which is a disaster deal that never should have seen the light of day. It's our chance to influence NAFTA talks in a very progressive way to ratchet up pressure on higher wages and labor standards, to undo the mistakes of the past. And I guarantee that this and other work will come to a screeching halt under a conservative government. And you know what? We just can't let that happen. And we won't let that happen. So sisters and brothers, are you ready to fight? Yeah. Are you ready to make these next 12 months count? Are you ready to move the union forward?
to build it stronger over the next five years. I want to thank you, sisters and brothers, for the work you do each and every day. You inspire me. We have made one hell of a difference. We changed the face of progressive politics in this country. We've made history, and we're going to continue to make history. Thank you all very much. Let's have a good convention. Thank you. Thank you. Let's do it.